15. Swallowing the Key Perspective is everything. Will had made that observation on one of our first dates when he pointed to the glass on his left that was simultaneously on my right, and it stuck with me. At the time, I thought he was handing me a clue about how he navigated the world. Soon enough, I began to see the principle as something I could apply to our relationship, as in, we may disagree strongly or react differently to various situations, but by acknowledging our differences in perspective, we can avoid rejecting the other person's point of view in order to feel heard. But how can we understand a significant other's perspective if, A, we don't have the experience, maturity, or desire to identify differences, and B, we lack the ability to recognize there is no right or wrong, except in situations where abuse is evident. Often, with the inevitable misunderstandings and even heartbreaks that come along with most serious relationships, we forget that our opinions, priorities, and needs aren't better than our partners. They are just different. Unrealistic expectations are not our fault. It's the fairy tale of romanticized love that has instilled the many false beliefs that enforce, if we love each other, we must think alike, right? If you really love me, you must know all my needs at all times without me having to tell you, right? And if you don't live up to these expectations, I have the right to disrespect you, treat you like an enemy, and look for what I need elsewhere because you are choosing not to give me what I need, right? No, no, not true. Still, we frequently feel betrayed and unloved when our significant other is oppositional in perspective to how we think things should be. In our discomfort, we ignore that not allowing for differences is unkind to the person we say we love so deeply. It's also unkind to ourselves. We rarely pause to measure or even identify the damage done to us by romanticized ideals from movies, songs, TV shows, books, ads, and other people's glossy narratives of their dreamy lives. With those happily ever after fairy tales in our heads, we dive into committed relationships as if we know how to have healthy, deeply loving bonds. Because those stories make love look so easy, showing partners always in agreement, we think that's what real love must always be. If you agree with me, you love me. If you love me, you agree with me. Though I don't consider myself a romantic, I expected Will to save me and heal my past hurts, as if the traumas, chaos, and depression experienced before we met would magically disappear within the ether of our ecstatic love. If I hadn't been caught up in the fantasy of how my Prince Charming would make all my pain disappear as he rode me off into the sunset, I'm sure that, as a new wife and mother, I would have given more space to my own history. I would have acknowledged that I had only recently tried to extract myself from the Hollywood life and the hope of making a smaller, more intimate one in Baltimore. Or maybe I would have been more thoughtful about my choice to stop therapy once I went off Prozac. Not long after a series of devastating losses that I hadn't processed. In many ways, Will and I were like so many young couples who grow up with instability and dysfunction, but do not acquire the tools to confront them. We were starting our journey after being thrust together into expanding families, booming careers, and big shifts in fortune and responsibility. Besides that, Will and I were trying to figure it all out under the increasingly hot lights that come with being celebrities and having to live up to a fantasy version of married life. True, not everyone deals with the glare of the public eye. Yet, most newlyweds have everyday challenges, some expected, some not, and need to show the world that they've won the sweepstakes of marital bliss. Admitting to growing pains is severely frowned upon. While fairy tale thinking gets in the way of accepting differences in perspective, the other trap for me was perfectionism. Denying the humanness of the people we love is a trap.
My thinking was, I'm sorry, sir, ma'am, but in our relationship, you can no longer be human. I've been hurt enough. From here on out, you better get every damn thing right. And don't worry about me, because I'm on point when it comes to loving you, even if I'm full of pain. Oh, yeah, I was textbook. Love is hard enough to define on our own terms, and harder still in relationships, where we're bound to have different points of view on what love is, how to love others, and how to love ourselves. And the thing is, in the game of love, we are all depending on each other while navigating those different perspectives at the same time. One of the big challenges I faced in the beginning of our marriage was that, rather than expressing disappointment or bruised feelings, I held fast to the motto, never let them see you sweat. My fallback position, rather than showing vulnerability, was to hide, cover my feelings, or fight, whether overtly or covertly. Being a graduate of the University of the Be More Streets, I was quick to pop off in the early days of relating to Will when there were disagreements between us. Will could talk circles around me at that time, so when I felt he wasn't listening and was being disrespectful, that would piss me off. Once in a heated argument, I let go in F you, fighting in the style I knew best. Will wasn't having it. He said, in effect, I can't be in a relationship with you. This isn't going to work. He broke out with me on the spot. His explanation was that, considering the abuse he had grown up watching between his parents and how things had escalated rapidly from verbal to physical, he was not willing to participate in this kind of intense interaction with me. So you're going to break up with me over some words? I asked. Will answered, yes. Over the next week, I tried to consider his perspective. My experience was different from his. But in certain relationships in which I felt threatened, slinging words was one way to protect myself. Still, I could see that there was a more respectful way of handling communication. We were only broken up for one week. However, Will had set an important boundary. And he did so in a way that I couldn't ignore. It was one thing to add profanity to the expression of ideas or viewpoints, but another thing when it was used in a personal attack. My eyes were open to how words could become weaponized and just as violent as blows. Similarly, disrespect can lead to emotional violence, another reason to be mindful of how words are spoken. Will made it clear what he was willing to tolerate. If we're going to be together, we can't do that to each other. I agreed. After that incident, I didn't curse at him again. Not for decades, at least. Our agreement not to use profanity or disrespectful language or tones led to improved communication. But the unintended consequence of our more respectful talks was that they were often devoid of the honest expression of emotions, sometimes overly intellectual or analytical. Imagine having to sit down and speak about the moments when some women flirted with him in front of me and having to be cool, even-toned, analytical, and dispassionate about it. This pattern kept us safe from talking about real feelings, but also from experiencing them. Some couples manage to argue authentically. In our case, our arguments verged on being too sanitized and controlled, to the point where I'd lose genuine expression and suppress deep feelings. There would come a day when I'd wake up and feel fully disconnected from emotional honesty, my inner compass, and that would wreak havoc, but we'll get to that. By the time we were married with children, it was obvious to me that Will and I had very different perspectives about the trappings of fame. Ripples of our differences showed up early in our relationship, but I tended to ignore them because the ride was all-consuming. Magic Mountain? My homegirl Keisha was excited. You sure it won't be too crazy? It's a weekday, I assured her, and went over the plan I put together for her and her family, who were out visiting me, to join Will and Trey and me on an outing to a nearby area amusement park. 
Will was on his way to becoming the undisputed champion of the box office and had already spent more than six years on TV screens in the homes of millions of people around the world. Being welcoming to fans was part of his work ethic. But, increasingly, it was hard to go places just with our crew to have a good time. For that reason, we tried to go out when things were less crowded so we could wander freely and enjoy ourselves. Everything was rolling pretty smoothly, as I recall, until a group of fans spotted Will and began running toward us, practically in hysterics as they tried to get close to him. It was like a loud, excited stampede. With a primitive survival instinct and probably some PTSD kicking in, I started screaming, Back the fuck up! Back up! In full fight or flight mode, I couldn't stop myself. Even with Trey standing in between Will and me, terrified and feeling trapped, I was ready to swing wildly and dared anyone to come closer. The crowd paused and looked at me as if I were insane, Will included. When I looked up at him, he seemed bewildered by the intensity of my reaction and could only ask me to calm down. Physically, we had two different perspectives because of our different vantage points. At 6'2", Will could see over the crowd enough to know that there was no real threat. I'm five feet tall on a good day, tiny compared to everyone charging at me. And in my wash of adrenaline, all I could see was the oncoming rush of bodies. All I could hear were screams as hands went reaching across my face. Will managed to calm the horde, and we all went about our day unscathed. But I was shaken. To him... I had overreacted, even though I'd been in an unconscious, full-court press trauma response. To me, he was underreacting and unwilling to see how getting mobbed would make me feel that we were all being threatened. This was classic. You could take this example of conflicting perspectives and apply it to everything else in our entire marriage and get the same result. Sometimes you can find common ground to balance out your differences. But if you don't attempt to reconcile the warring viewpoints at play, resentment, anger, and regret will only grow. Our perspectives were reversed when it came to paparazzi. For Will, photographers brought out a trauma response similar to the one I had with crowds. For him, Taking unwanted photos was a violation, and he perceived that as a threat. It raised his alarm system for fight or flight. With paparazzi, though they can be annoying, I didn't feel the same lack of control I did with swarming crowds. I learned early in my career to create my own comfort zone by acknowledging the people with cameras and saying, I'll give you the pictures you want, but you got to back up. Give me 20 feet. As long as they didn't come up right in my face, I was good. No problem, Jada, was the response I'd usually get. So the paps and I shared mutual respect. But all of this, crowds, fans, paps, came with the territory. And I would have to learn to deal. I also learned that being in Hollywood didn't mean we'd left where we came from behind. I mean, I was living the supposed dream. And one of my closest friends was murdered, even though he was music royalty. And it was here where, in adapting, Will and I shared a perspective that our responsibility was to provide for and to bring as many people as we possibly could along with us on our ride. Some might call this survivor's guilt. This meant that he and I were usually the first calls whenever anyone in our circle needed help. Those startling calls during the hours when you know it ain't good news would roll in. Folks needing bail money, help after an accident, or funds to pay for a funeral when a person's son got murdered, or someone had an illness and was in need of a special doctor, someone was in trouble and had to pay for a lawyer. We had the resources, wanted to help, and felt obligated to do so if we could. Every time a call came in, I was humble and grateful that we had come as far as we had. But I did realize that even with our combined success, 
We didn't have the magic to banish all woes and make life problem-free for our family, friends, and extended community, though others might have hoped that was the case. We spent a lot of time trying to be heroes for a lot of people while not focusing enough on ourselves and one another. It was as though saving others came to define our worth. We were like so many people in every walk of life who, though well-intentioned, find our value in overextending ourselves on behalf of others to the point of being incapable of self-care. Will and I were equally clueless in this respect. Some of our differences in perspective weren't problematic. Will wanted to be one of the biggest names in Hollywood and was always surprised that I didn't. For my part, I admired his drive, his tenacity, and his courage to push the boundaries of what some deemed acceptable for an artist of color. He set out to show the world that an actor of color was as viable with global audiences as our white counterparts and to open doors for others in underrepresented communities. I was proud of him for that. With both of us balancing career and family, there was even less time left over for us to check in with each other and address differences in a deep way. Every attempt to resolve our competing perspectives ended up with us kicking the can down the road and Will's decree. We'll get to that later. That became the theme song of our relationship. Everything blew up fast. Time was the commodity we did not have. Will was on his fast train to stardom, and I was putting in my own fuel, doing my best to live up to the unattainable standards of being a perfect wife and mother. I had no one to blame. Not only had I signed up for this ride, I had taken my seat on it within my handmade gilded cage. Then I swallowed the damn key. By the time Jaden was a toddler, our household was rapidly outgrowing our home in Westlake. The guest rooms were always filled with visiting relatives and friends of Will's who'd been by his side for years. There was Charlie Mack for one, who, mind you, lived with us before Jaden was born and liked to blast Chico de Barge at 5 a.m., damn near every morning, until we had a conversation about it. The great thing is that Charlie is like my big bro, and we could be on some real talk, always. After just a few words, he smiled and even looked surprised that he had been so unaware. From then on, I never again heard Chico as the sun came up. Will deferred to me when it came to most of the decisions relating to running our bustling household. During this time frame, we were most likely the only black couple in our neighborhood, which made for some interesting encounters with the mostly white service providers, who, though polite, appeared unaccustomed to being hired by young black homeowners, famous or not. Most of the time, I handled whatever issues came up, but if there was something I really wanted Will's input on, of course I would ask. That's what I did on the day I called him at work after an incident with an exterminator. I could tell by the tone of Will's voice when he answered his phone that it wasn't a good time. Being as succinct as possible, I prefaced my recap by saying, I've always felt like I had a good rapport with this man. We were cool. However, I went on. Since our pest problem had been resolved, I'd informed the exterminator that we wouldn't need his services any longer, adding, we'll call if anything changes. With me inside the kitchen, and the man outside my kitchen door. He forcefully insisted that we did need to continue his services. I held my ground, thanked him again, and asked him to bill us as he had done in the past. No, the man said indignant as he stepped through the door into the kitchen. You are going to pay me now. Who do you think you're talking to? I said. You no longer want my services, then you pay me now. With his chest puffed up, he inched toward me, raising all my safety alarms, not only for me, but for Jaden, who was in the house. A switch flipped inside me to protect mine at all cost. In fight mode, I grabbed the glass blender jar off my kitchen counter and raised it, warning him, you better get the fuck out my house. The man immediately backed out my kitchen door and was gone. 
What shook me most wasn't him. It was me, where I was willing to go. That place within me hadn't been activated in a minute, but it was definitely still primed to explode. The other piece was that I was hurt that someone with whom I had been cool could be so disrespectful and violate the safety in my own home. Will heard me out, saying little until I let him know, I'm okay, but can you believe he did that? His brief response confirmed he was in the middle of something. He basically said that I had handled it, and we would talk about it when he got home. Then I did what I usually did. I bossed up, got steely, and hid my need for reassurance. With a quick, cool, I said goodbye, and we hung up. We didn't talk about it later. We should have. It never should have been okay for me to gloss over someone making me feel violated in my own home. So much so that I'd felt it necessary to back him down. It never should have been okay for me to let Will gloss over it either. Had I clearly expressed my feelings? In hindsight, I'm almost positive that I had not. That is a confession. Even to this day, it is difficult for me to express how I really feel at any given moment. Any vulnerability makes me feel uncomfortably vulnerable. My inner monologue was going off. Will should know I need him and bring his ass home. Period. The biggest mistake I constantly made was thinking Will thought exactly how I did and that I shouldn't have to tell him how I was feeling. He should already know. Does any of this sound familiar? So many conversations and so many aspects of our lives got away from us. We had to learn on the fly to handle the issues of growing a family running a household, organizing the details of being constantly on the go. Ours was a classic version of learning to fly an airplane while we were still building it, as more and more passengers wanted to come on board. And of course, we wanted to share our lives with the people we loved. If we were heading to Aspen for Christmas, it wasn't just us and the three kids. It was us plus 40, family, friends, team members. The first time Will and I went to visit Aspen, I fell in love with the winter wonderland in the Colorado resort town. It reminded me of an old-fashioned holiday card. Once we had a family and wanted to show the kids a white Christmas, Aspen became our holiday destination of choice. And in the season that always gave me joy, I loved going all out. But we had no idea how this was done. We were on a constant learning curve, not to mention that every year we would have to top ourselves. Besides Christmas planning, and all that it entailed, one year Will had a brainstorm. We should throw a New Year's Eve party for our anniversary. Oh my God. I love a good party. But this soon became an annual celebration that I had to figure out and a year-round planning job as the guest list expanded to include every celeb in Aspen during that time. There were endless logistics. Will, the showman and MC, was like the executive producer, dreaming up experiences for all to enjoy, whereas I was the assistant producer, information point person, and for a while, everybody's girl Friday. Who was flying from where and getting picked up when, how many were at the house, and who all was staying in the hotel rooms? Who needed ski lift tickets and local transportation? And where were the toothbrushes? Even though I had Mia and Fawn to help, I was the -the on-the-ground communication hub at this point. As a new wife and mom, I was often overwhelmed by trying to adapt to an ever-larger whirlwind until I was able to put systems in place and hire more team members to help me. I kept putting one foot in front of the other, hoping to accommodate everyone's needs in our expanding world. Everyone around us saw only the glitter and excitement of our lives. Very rarely were people in touch with what was involved when 40-plus family and friends went on a Christmas vacation, or how exhausting it was to corral everyone on New Year's Eve, 1999, my second wedding anniversary, when the world was supposed to end. And I really just wanted to be quiet with my husband and family, and fly off to D.C. to stay overnight at the Clinton White House. The news broke in September. Actor Will Smith will host Washington's ultimate party of 99 
the multi-million dollar New Year's Eve celebration on the mall, for which a who's who of rock music will sing back up. This was a celebration on a scale never attempted by a president at a pivotal moment on the planet, when millions were terrified about the cliff we were going over into a new millennium. Our family's inclusion in history was thrilling beyond words. But when Will told me we were invited to stay overnight at the White House after a long, tiring night with young children, I had to say, this is too much. Jada, it's the Lincoln bedroom. We get to sleep in the same room as the Emancipation Proclamation. Will, I get it. But after that long night, I'm not trying to stay in Lincoln's dusty-ass bedroom. Will thought I was being ridiculous. He couldn't believe it. Sorry, babe, this is history. These kids will remember this all their lives. I didn't bother to tell him that 15-month-old Jaden would have zero memory of it. Long story short, I was overruled. And we went in style. Gianni Versace designed outfits for us both. And we'll rock the stage. The world did not end. And I survived. Although I was able to say, I told you so to Will about all five of us trying to sleep in that small-ass bed in that dusty-ass bedroom, emancipation proclamation and all. It's inevitable for anyone willing to take a ride on someone else's bullet train that at some point you start to feel lost while traveling to that person's destinations. It happens to so many of us, not just in the entertainment world, but in many facets of life. To prevent this, I fought hard to have my own professional identity, separate from Will. But to my shock, after I happily became Mrs. Will Smith, it was as if it was the only name I ever had. Even after years of establishing myself as Jada Pinkett, it was like everything I had done before my marriage, all I had built, no longer mattered. My identity had never been hijacked in a relationship before. It was no fault of Will's, of course, but of the age-old tropes that portray women who marry successful men as doing so for their entire validation. She dare not try to have an identity beyond who she is in service of his identity. Before long, I noticed people who wanted a piece of me because they wanted to get to Will. That wasn't what I expected when I went in to meet with Harvey Weinstein about a short film I had produced with the wonderful Ann Carley that we wanted to adapt into a full-length feature called When Willows Touch. It was written and directed by the then-up-and-coming, truly gifted Shonda Rhimes. I had starred opposite the extraordinarily talented actor Jeffrey Wright. The meeting with Harvey was to talk about acquiring the script to make the movie. He was all business, which I appreciated. But he made it clear that he would be interested in moving ahead only if Will's name was attached to the project as an executive producer. When Harvey said this, I was quiet and had to think hard. I couldn't do it. I understood from a Hollywood perspective, Will Smith was the big brand name. But so was Denzel Washington, who was very interested in starring in the project. Although Will and I had projects we developed together in those days, the projects came about organically. We never collaborated as a play to get things made. I could see the trap. I knew if I yielded to that request on this project, it would be expected the next time and the next time after that by everyone else. With regret. I withdrew the film. I refused to trade on Will's success. Our most profound difference in perspectives was a clash in our visions of what happiness looked like. Will was living his dream, and that meant I must be living mine too, through him. He couldn't understand why I was often unhappy. His attitude was, why would you want for anything? Look at the life and opportunities I provide for you all we get to have and do and be. My attitude was, yes, you have a point. But I have hitched a ride on someone else's train, someone I love, 
except I don't know how to jump off from time to time to ride my own train. It feels like I can't grasp my own journey. At times I feel resentful and angry. Mostly, I don't know what to do about it. We can be overloved, underloved, overworked, underworked. Each costs much. Clarissa Pinkola Estes. Whether it's love or work, over or under, all of it can feel like a cage. And any of us might swallow the key. And do you know what that key unlocks? Our power to create a fulfilling life we are proud of. So many of us are willing to swallow the key to our own treasure troves in order to have the love and acceptance we desire from others. Too often we feel the need to be more in order to be loved and not abandoned. Women are chronically burdened by having to prove that we have value and therefore should be allowed to live, as Clarissa Pinkola Estes puts it. Sometimes the key we swallow is the truth-telling part of us that questions whether a relationship is feeding or starving us. If we swallow the key, we can't ask the questions. It's hard to look at our traps, even when they make themselves obvious. One example is when we are being objectified and used for enjoyment instead of being sought as a partner in a quest to be seen and loved. Or, when we are expected to simply be compliant and fun and never complain because we fear these words. You know there's a side chick dying to take your place. Here's the deal. When we abandon ourselves by swallowing the key to our happiness for the alleged happiness of someone else, there is no happiness to be found by either party. You still feel pain and the other feels your resentment. But if we are courageous, life can offer another kind of pain that's far more sacred. Pain that will deliver you your pride, your power, your happiness, instead of self-betrayal. It's up to you to whether you're brave enough to face that pain. Only you know what's holding you back from spitting out the key and using it to open the gates to your inner kingdom. Do you want your key back? Write down how you may have lost it and consider why you want to regain it. And if you have been through an arduous passage of retrieving your key already, why not write down your key lessons? Take a moment to pat yourself on the back and be prepared to share that story with someone who's in need of how to do the same. Chapter 16 Wild Banshee The story I'm about to tell you has many entry points, but if I didn't trace the main thread back to my years in Baltimore, I would miss the chance to honor my grandmother. Marion wanted me to be able to explore worlds different from my own so that later on, no matter who I met, we could share some common ground. My openness and love for all kinds of music starts there. From the classical composers I heard in her house, to the R&B, disco, classic rock, and even country my mother loved. From the reggae and Caribbean rhythms played at my Aunt Sondra's, to the club music and old school hip-hop I heard on the dance floor and at the skating rink. From the 1980s alternative bands that Pac, John, and I obsessed over, all the way to my exposure to hard rock and heavy metal in the home of Uncle Leslie and Aunt Marcia. My uncle listened to everything. Led Zeppelin, Iron Maiden, Queen, Black Sabbath, Metallica, the list goes on. I'll never forget holding the Ozzy Osbourne solo album, Bark at the Moon, and seeing him actually howling at the moon, like a werewolf with fangs. I was captivated. Ozzy was hauntingly compelling. Listening to his music in its hard-edged, melodic glory, I was transported. Coupled with his badass lead guitarist, thematic storylines, and melodic hooks, 
he stole my imagination. R&B may have sat in my soul more than other musical forms, but metal, hard rock, had a different kind of power and sway over me. It spoke to something deeply primal within, so much so that I had always wanted to do it myself, to express that energy within me and let it rock out for real. The actress and singer, Tashina Arnold, once said in my birthday video that she believed there was a white man trapped inside of me somewhere. Metal brings out a fierceness in me, and that genre of music allowed a safe space for its release. By the time I was 15 and Guns N' Roses appeared on the scene, I was hooked. My dream of dreams then was to be the first female Axl Rose. There were some iconic females who rocked hard and whom I admired. Susie Quattro, Doro Pesh, Joan Jett, Hart, and Stevie Nicks. But at the time, there weren't many black women, to the best of my knowledge, on the rock scene. It wasn't until I was introduced to the London-based band Skunk Anansi, fronted by Skin, a remarkable, bad-as-hell lead singer, that I found a black woman who could rock like that. Of course, Big Mama Thornton, Memphis Minnie, and Sister Rosetta Tharp had been pioneers in the rock game, but their contributions as black women are often underplayed. Sometimes it takes only one exception to the rule to prove that you, too, can go against the grain. Other times, you have to become your own exception to the rule. I'd always had a secret desire to form my own rock band, but with juggling my roles as wife and mother and a career of my own, that dream fell to the side and soon felt out of reach. For the most part, my acting career continued to be fulfilling, with new opportunities to tackle a range of characters and film genres. But Hollywood had a certain formula, a requirement to abide by rules of conformity that wasn't natural to me. There's only so much rebellion tolerated in the Hollywood game. For instance, on the Tales from the Crypt, Demon Knight, which I took as a chance to work with the delightful director, Ernest Dickerson, and in the horror genre, which I loved, I showed up for a costume fitting after cutting my hair very short and dyeing it sandy platinum blonde. Executive producer Joel Silver, who was very influential and powerful at the time, called me to his office. When I auditioned for the role, my hair was dark, he reminded me, blasting me for thinking I could just change my look because the idea had struck my fancy. I didn't interrupt Joel. There was a part of me that knew he was right. I could understand it wasn't professional to switch up your look after being hired for a role, sporting another approved aesthetic. But there was the more impulsive nature within me that was not willing to have its energy challenged. I nodded respectfully, trying to be contrite, though I couldn't stop myself from saying, but it's hot. You gotta admit it. Joel glowered and sent me on my way. Interesting. Despite his loud disapproval about my hair color and style change, he didn't request any changes. A clue that he thought it was dope as well. I was not used to asking for permission for nothing, especially when it came to what I wanted to do with my person. Hollywood never seemed to know how to tame me and I didn't want to be tamed. Part of that meant being myself, no matter whom I was sitting in front of. That tended to be a double-edged sword. It was Warren Beatty who later offered me a gentler perspective after I gave my feedback on his script for Bullworth. This was one of those scripts that Warren wanted to keep quiet, so I had to go to his office to read it, as he was thinking of me to co-star. After doing so, I gave him my honest opinion. This is not realistic. I felt it was culturally inauthentic. I can't do this. Warren was impressed, though my tone and approach may have been off-putting as I continued to critique his script. Warren listened with his charming smile and veteran patience. He could see, however, that my edgy tone, accompanied by raw honesty, wouldn't always go over well in a town full of grand egos. After I decided the movie wasn't for me, Warren invited me to lunch. In so many words, he 
He pointed out that maybe it would be to my benefit to soften my approach a bit. He expressed that I was talented, funny, and charming, but at times I could come off as abrasive. He was asking me to allow more of the delight under my hard exterior to peer through. This was the first time anyone had taken the time to put this to me in such a non-judgmental way, and I appreciated it. He didn't make me wrong for being who I am. He was just asking me to be willing to show more sides of myself. He made it clear that I didn't have to betray myself by softening my edges either. That was fair. Taking his input into account, I also realized I needed to find a space outside Hollywood for the wild banshee within, the one who didn't give a fuck about being soft or delightful. It was time to move to venture into a different world. Magically, the world I needed found me. When I fall for a passion of any kind, I fall hard. And I go all in. That's how I felt when Will brought home the deck for the Matrix. At that point, he was the filmmaker's first choice to play Neo. Though it looked more like a comic book when I first flipped through it, the images immediately captured my imagination and had me creatively salivating. I was a hardcore anime fan, and I believed that if they could pull off cinematically what what was imaged on paper, this movie would be one of the greatest of all time. Oh my God, I said to Will, overwhelmingly excited seeing the possibility of turning Japanese anime style into gravity-defying live action. He glanced down at the deck that I was holding. How are they going to pull this off? They have some new technology they're working with. He gave me the rundown of the filmmaker's plan. What? Hell no, that's going to be crazy! Not only would their approach to action be insane, but the plot was revolutionary a story in which humanity has to overcome all their differences to fight a war against the machines. The Matrix was a promising endeavor all around. Will wasn't seeing it. We clearly had different perspectives, but he was further torn as he was considering the role of Muhammad Ali. Soon enough, he chose the latter, the right choice for him at the time. The Wachowskis, so ahead of their time, through the widest and most diverse casting net, which for me was one of the most promising and impressive components of the project. Before Hollywood attempted to jump on the diversity bandwagon, the Wachowskis understood the importance of diverse representation that spanned way beyond ethnicity. As directors, they were expressing how they saw the world beyond heterosexual white folk surviving in an apocalyptic future. Once Keanu Reeves took on the role of Neo, as if it had been written for him all along, the next quest was to cast Trinity, the female lead. When I got the call to audition and became a serious contender, I just about lost my mind. Though they had begun by wanting a black male lead, when that didn't work, they were open to casting a female lead of color opposite Keanu including Selma Hayek, who was also in the mix for Trinity. Selma and I both went through a series of physical movement auditions to make sure we could pull off the martial arts that Trinity would command. Luckily, I had done extensive fight training for previous films. After Lawrence Fishburne signed on as Morpheus, the cast diversified further, which made me want in on the project even more. I felt like the role of Trinity had my name on it, and I was so happy when the directors liked my audition and asked me to come in for a chemistry read with Keanu. This was sure to be a walk in the park. I mean, I was a huge fan of Keanu's. Guess what? We had absolutely no chemistry in the reading. Absolutely none. Zero. I could not have been more shocked. Usually when I don't get a role I really want, I find myself thinking that I would have been the better choice. But to this day, I can't think of anyone who would have been a better Trinity than Carrie Ann Moss. 
She was the dopest. This is one of the few roles I lost to another actress where I'm here to tell you I couldn't have embodied that part the way Carrie Ann did. So it seemed that being part of the Matrix phenomenon wasn't in the cards. That is, until the Wachowskis decided to launch a Matrix franchise and chose to write two sequels. Cut to, I'm as busy as ever in my last trimester with Willow when I get a call that the Wachowskis want to meet about a role in the sequels. The answer is yes before I even get the details. I sit in front of them in their office with Willow as a big ball in my tummy. We have a character named Niobe that we wrote with you in mind, one of them says. Ever since my Trinity audition, the other says, I've been in their thoughts for a future character. Now I cannot explain how honored, excited, and flattered I was. I sat there as cool as possible while they went on asking when the baby was due because shooting and training would start in November. Willow was actually due in November, but I blurted out, oh, I'm delivering in October. I was not missing this opportunity and later would have to admit that my statement was a bit of a stretch. This meant that whenever Willow was born, I would have to lose the baby weight and get into top shape really fast. It was going to be tight, but I assured them that I'd be ready. Fortunately, Willow kept me honest by bringing herself into the world on Halloween two weeks early. While still pregnant, I cranked up my usual gym workout. I had a start date at the end of November for three months of shooting. I had to be ready, and I had a month. After Willow arrived, I doubled down in the gym, embarking on one of the most intense training regimens of my life with the one and only Daryl Foster, the same superstar fitness and fight trainer who helped Will get ready to play Muhammad Ali. I began my motion capture work in pretty darn good shape. Baby Willow and toddler Jaden with me, my homegirl Fawn and Gammy, who would be on the set while I shot all day. My mom would bring Willow from my trailer to the set every hour on the hour so I could breastfeed. Whatever baby weight I'd gained fell away fast, and nursing Willow helped. But before long, I gained 15 pounds of muscle after working up to pressing 10 plates on either side of the leg machine and managing to bench press 175 pounds as one press. I had never been so ripped in my life. Over my two-year journey with The Matrix, Daryl had me so conditioned. We even thought about me competing as a bikini bodybuilder. I was doing gymnastics class, fight training with the cast, and weight training with Daryl. Working out became my life. I got so strong in Rammy that I would even try Will sometimes, playfully bucking up on him and saying things like, I can kick your ass now. Now Will was in his best shape ever after Ali. Strong as hell and had no problem proving me wrong every time. Let me just say, when you want to test your strength with someone who is heavyweight ready, remember to tap out when they tell you to. My little muscles had me tripping. After the Matrix was done and the cast was on the press tour, I had a series of conversations with Keanu about what we were looking forward to doing next. Knowing he had a band called Dogstar, I mentioned that music was calling me. With vicarious interest, I asked, How do you feel when you're on stage with your band? He thought a moment before he answered, but when he did, I could see a whole other side of Keanu. He talked about how fulfilling it was, and I could see how freeing the experience could be. Yes, that's what I needed. I needed something freeing for myself. I confessed. You know, I've actually thought about putting a band together, but do it. Why not? Keanu said. The logistics of putting a band together couldn't be that hard, I figured. I had so much I wanted to say, so much I wanted to express. Before I ever began, Keanu gave me the best advice. Ignore what people have to say, he urged. People would talk shit, I realized. But as he said, that's not your problem. His lasting wisdom, just have fun. I had seen that example in Cree Summer and her band, back in our A Different World days. 
Watching her rock out on stage gave me a vicarious thrill, with her crystal power rays bursting across the crotch of her pants. In razor, sharp songs like Curious White Boy, she hit hard on issues of race and gender, speaking to the soul of the well-written-upon woman, and especially black women. Cree was the baddest. Between her and Keanu, I was inspired. As soon as the family got back to the States and we settled into our new home in Hidden Hills, I told Will about my decision. He was all for it. From there, a whole new world outside of my handmade gilded cage opened up where I could kick, scream, spit, and growl. The announcement I never in my life expected to hear a few years into my metal music journey was, Next week, at the Viper Room, Sharon Osbourne is coming through to hear you play. What? Yeah, Sharon wants to check you out for a possible slot on the Ozfest tour. My band members and I were all clear that Sharon, the wife of Ozzy Osbourne and the power center of Ozfest, the biggest rock and metal summer festival in the world, was the one who would make the decision based on the performance she was there to see that evening. Of course, we'd been around only three years, and I didn't want to get my hopes up that there was a chance to be part of the festival. We would just have to go out there, give it our all, and hope our eclectic metal sound would make the cut. This was such an amazing opportunity, and we had fought hard for it. When we got started, it didn't take long for me to come up with Wicked Wisdom as the band's name. Wicked was a salute to my West Indian roots, meaning dope, excellent, or even unusual. And wisdom was the state one attained when the deepest truths had been absorbed and practiced. Songs poured from the pit of my heart and bowels as if they'd been waiting there for years, screaming to be heard. Titles, lyrics, and melodies came to me effortlessly and filled up notebooks, scraps of paper, even napkins. Wicked Wisdom was composed of a very talented group of black male musicians, starting with lead guitarist Pocket Honoré. Pocket, the name he earned because he was always in the pocket of the rhythm, intensity, and feeling, was originally from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and he had a musical sensibility that added a unique rhythmic hump to our metal sound. Pocket put a whole lot of soul on that driving metal guitar. For one of Wicked Wisdom's first incarnations, other band members I was fortunate to have joined were Cameron Graves, rhythm and keyboards, an exceptional musician who can also play classical and jazz music, Rio Lawrence, bass, may his soul rest in peace, and Philip Fisher, drums. They all contributed to our sound, which was eventually dubbed New Metal. Over the years, others would add their talents, including Taylor Graves, keyboards, Aaron Haggerty, drums, and Thomas Pridgen, drums, who would join a later incarnation of the band called Wicked Evolution. In the beginning, we were more in the lane of R&B-flavored rock, but the more we played together, the harder we pushed toward an edgier full metal sound. In one of my first conversations with my manager, Miguel Melendez, about my new venture, he seemed baffled. A big bro, partner, and trusted advisor on many fronts of my acting producing careers, Miguel asked in a respectful but skeptical tone, metal? He had to admit, out the gate, that he wasn't familiar with how to move in the metal music scene. Rather than discourage me, Miguel brought in Dennis Sanders, a promoter and manager who had worked with Papa Roach, knew the terrain, understood my vision, and started booking us in every venue he could. Dennis would book us here and there and everywhere, the plan being for us to cut our teeth. As long as there was an address of some sort, or a spot on the map alleging to be an arena, club, bar, or a cornfield with a falling-down shack in the middle of it, wicked wisdom went. There was a method to the madness. You can't really know what's working or not working until you get out there and play. With this came a lot of trial and error and raising of eyebrows. Still, it was that vibe in early 2004 that helped Dennis book us a two-month gig as the opening act for the European leg of Britney Spears' Onyx Hotel Tour. 
music critics were puzzled. Reviewers got the old school rock and soul part, but didn't understand why we were opening for the reigning princess of pop. They weren't entirely wrong. Then again, we learned quickly how to put on a show and build energy in front of huge crowds. We learned even more being on a major tour that had so many moving pieces. One of the things I loved most about traveling on a tour bus overseas was being able to share the adventure with Jaden and Willow, who were six and four at the time. At different stops, depending on his schedule, Will would join us too, but often it was just me and the kids. Between shows in different cities, I'd have a lot of downtime during the day after our rehearsals. That meant the kids and I could hang out. They could have music lessons with the different band members, or we'd do a little sightseeing. Traveling the United States after our return from Europe, I saw my country as never before and exposed the kids to as many walks of life as possible. We saw America. We traveled the highways and the byways. Some of the most fun we had was when we had to sleep overnight in our bus at a truck stop during a major snowstorm. We ended up having breakfast there and hanging out with truckers. We had the best time. We were given the gift of going places that weren't exactly tourist destinations, like Paris, Texas, that we never would have had a reason to visit if not for music. Many of our stops were in what are known as the flyover states, where, yes, many of the metal fans are white men and women who had never seen a band like Wicked Wisdom perform for them. One of my favorite, most euphoric moments was in such a setting. The first sighting of this place as we drove up made me think there had been a mistake. It was basically in the middle of a cornfield. It looked like a big shack, a makeshift shack at that, in the middle of absolutely nowhere. We walked in, and it was packed to the rafters with white kids who had no clue what to make of us. We could also see by their numbers that they were ready to rock out and throw down, even if they were a bit skeptical. We were used to that. The lighting also looked like it had been rigged awkwardly. Somebody had scattered some big work lights around, the kind you see at night for road repairs, that did little to illuminate the large space. Some indoor venues had a gate that separated the stage from the audience below. These gates were thought to be useful as a barrier between performers and unruly members of the crowd so no one got the bright idea to climb up onto the stage. This shack-slash-club had those gates out in front of the stage, and the kids were already pressed up against it, waiting to see what we could do. After we finished setting up and doing a quick sound check, the shack's manager came up and pointed out the very low ceiling with tons of wires hanging down. He warned me, don't try to reach for the ceiling. You could electrocute yourself. At most shows, I would climb out on top of those barriers to better connect with the crowd. This ceiling was so low, I could have used it to help stabilize me. You use what you have, right? Once the show started, I got more and more hyped, and the audience got more and more hyped, and I forgot myself. The crowd paid tribute to what they were hearing by assembling into full-blown mosh pits, thrashing into one another with abandon, doing what I was used to doing, I jumped up on the gate to be closer to the crowd. Overtaken by the wild banshee within, I completely forgot about the open wires in the ceiling, reached up to grab a bar for stability, and damn near electrocuted myself. For a split second, I felt a very light surge and instantly regained the memory that I was not to reach for the ceiling. I quickly removed my hand and relied on security to hold me up by the waist on that gate. What was crazy about the night was that as different as our places of origins were, those kids in that club slash shack embraced us and went non-stop bananas. Every preconceived notion that they must have had, who was this black metal band with a black female lead singer, vanished. Every preconceived notion I had, who are these white kids in this shack out in the middle of this cornfield, vanished. Color lines, economic differences, cultural differences, all vanished. We shared one reality, the need to have a good fucking time. We were all raging so hard together, we had communion. 
We shared a true escape from all the worries, discomforts, judgments, and pain that life had to offer. We reveled in connection through music in a genre most believed had no place for black folks, especially black women, especially a famous black woman. Our differences were moot on the common ground of rocking the F out and leaving everything we had on the floor. After we played, many of the kids thanked us for coming to their neck of the woods. In so many words, what I heard them saying was, thank you for coming here and seeing us, for giving a fuck that we are here. We know you didn't have to, because so many don't. In my metal journey, I learned about the countless white Americans from lower economic to working class communities who feel unheard and discarded by a country they think has abandoned them. Some blame people who look like me or blame the government for being corrupt. In five years on the road, I also came to understand racism on a deeper level by being in the belly of the beast. We fear what and whom we don't know. When we get past the fear, we have to give up some of our biases, which I did after seeing the deprivation of the white hood and witnessing white poverty firsthand. I discovered similarities between poor black folk, and poor white folk in this country because poverty strips all people, no matter their color, of their dignity and self-worth. My eyes were open to the reality of a world where, if you're white, you are thought to have no business being poor, to have no place or value. Hence the idea of white trash, the discarded people, Yet a people who have been raised to believe this country is more their birthright than anyone else's. Now, being a black woman, I'm not here to express the experience of poor white Americans. I can only express my limited perception and understanding of what I witnessed while on the road. Seeing the commonality of struggle from poor to working and middle classes helped rinse away some of my prejudices and misunderstandings. This unlikely cultural immersion gave me a new experience of how art can bridge the chasms that divide us. Our audition for OzFest took place on the night of April 15th, 2005, a Friday, when we played the legendary Viper Room on the Sunset Strip in Hollywood. Compared to most of the dives where we'd been playing, the Viper Room, leather booths, jewel tone lighting, moody and sexy, was pretty glamorous. But that's not what made this night special and exciting. This was the night that Sharon Osbourne, as promised, came to hear us play. As always, we took a moment backstage to connect as a group, say a prayer, showing some gratitude before we hit the stage. Then I added my usual, let's go fuck shit up. Passion is contagious. That's one thing with us that was never in question. As a vocalist, I'd grown a lot, learning how to sing and growl at a high volume without losing my voice. Our new metal sound worked with my voice and my expression for sure, although where I felt most in my comfort zone was in my showwomanship. I loved absorbing the energy of the audience and delivering a memorable performance. Plus, my band was badass. I had a great time that night, which I hoped meant we had a great show. Once I got off stage, Dennis grabbed me from backstage and brought me to Sharon's booth. We went through the formalities of introducing ourselves and got through some small talk, and then, Jada, she began, and held me in a second of suspense before she went on, keeping it short and sweet. I'm putting you on Ozfest. Get ready so excited, all I could do was hug her, with a big thank you all over it. Sharon smiled and nodded, showing that she was happy for me as well. I thought I understood what get ready meant, while Sharon, in the moment, knew exactly what I would be up against. Her subtext was that if I wanted the shot, she was going to give it to me, but it wouldn't be an easy ride. As I reflect back, I see that she had as much to risk as I did, really. I wasn't the only one to face a barrage of criticism for my OzFest run that summer. Sharon was scathingly criticized for giving me the shot. 
The truth is that Sharon didn't have to put herself through that scrutiny, but she did. And I'd be forever grateful. Her decision made way for one of the most exciting, terrifying, enlightening experiences in this period of my life. By no accident, from this experience, both Jaden and Willow would find themselves at home in the world we traveled and continue on their own paths in music. Jaden found his own love for rock and roll and tour buses, and Willow took it even further and would learn to pick up a guitar, rock stages, and unleash her own wild banshee. Ironically, the first official announcement that Wicked Wisdom was going to OzFest happened right before I was going out for a live interview for BET. I was so excited, I couldn't help but let the audience know the great news. Word spread quickly through the metal community, and the backlash was fast and furious. Eventually, I would become a Jedi of letting the most ridiculous and malicious rumors roll off my back. Listen. Gossip magazines and online outlets can be disgusting and demoralizing. But nothing compares to actual threats like, we are going to stomp her, rape her, cut her head off, and put her naked body in a ditch. Especially when you're a performer in live settings. Though I tried to take all the venom in stride, I didn't always succeed. Thousands of entries on OzFest web forums went from predicting I wouldn't last the whole tour to saying Wicked Wisdom would ruin OzFest forever. One post said, Wicked Wisdom will be pelted by every loose object on the OzFest grounds. Another was, this is going to cause a effing riot. Bring your steel-toed boots. The death threats were so specific, and there were so many of them, that the head of my security detail was firm. We are suggesting you don't go. It's too dangerous. Ain't gonna lie. I was shook. But at the suggestion that I turn down this opportunity because of people's ignorance, I held fast. I'm going, was all I said. Will respected how important this was to me. Although he was concerned about what I was going to face, he knew it ultimately had to be my call and supported my decision. If this were today in a time of rampant racial violence, I would have reconsidered, and I surely would have not taken my kids out on the road with me. The deciding factor was recognizing everything that had been overcome by my ancestors in far more harrowing circumstances than being a black metal band on Ozfest. This was not the middle passage, or escaping on the Underground Railroad or walking through the doors of a white school flanked by federal marshals as six-year-old Ruby Bridges had done in 1960, or even facing the barrage of hate hurled at black entertainers and musicians who traveled across a segregated America at the risk of their lives while merely trying to earn a living and share their gifts. No, playing this summer festival was not that. Because of the strides of our forebears, we knew an audience was somewhere out there for us, so I sharpened my vigilance and took to the road. The first time we faced the reality of the threats was in Camden, New Jersey. Before our slot, I was informed that a sizable group of neo-Nazis was in the crowd. The guys and I conferred with one another, put on our armor, and said, in effect, let's do what we do. To counter the neo-Nazis were J.C., and an army of his homeboys work in the festival. J.C., a 6'3", 225-pound, ball-headed, tatted, Viking-looking white dude, knew ahead of time that we would face some difficulty out on tour. If you decided to judge a book by its cover, he'd look more hardcore than any of those neo-Nazis. And as soon as we were told what was happening in the crowd, J.C. assured me, that shit ain't gonna fly like that. I had no reason to doubt him. Boo! The air filled with the roar of angry skeptics before we even hit a note. We started to play, and the Heil Hitler salutes appeared. Before we finished the first song, I saw J.C. running from behind me to make a Herculean stage dive into the crowd of Nazis, brazenly banging his body into them. His vibe was very much, what's up? You want to fuck with somebody, fuck with me. 
And you know what they did? They cowered. Those men had so much heat to throw my way, but wanted no smoke from J.C. I got to see that day that most of those dudes, acting so hard and full of hate, were actually cowards. J.C. constantly reminded me, any man that treats a woman that way is a sorry-ass motherfucker. From that moment in Camden, no matter how chilly or hostile the vibe, I made it my business to walk through the crowd before and after the show to remind myself that there was nothing to be afraid of. And if there was anyone in the crowd who wanted to hurt me, well, here I was. For the most part, folks didn't even notice. At the end of the day, people paid their money to have a good time. If we could deliver that and maybe change some hearts and minds, we were good. One of the most refreshing aspects of being immersed in the world of metal and getting to step from behind the velvet rope was that nobody gave two Fs about the machine called Hollywood. They had real life to think about, and that helped me keep focus on the same. I think I'm coming down with something, I confessed to Will at the hotel where he was meeting up with me and the kids. We were in the Bay Area after an Ozfest performance. I hadn't been feeling well for a while, just excessively tired and very drained. Sitting down with Will, I knew that whatever it was, I couldn't ignore it any longer. Will suggested we find a doctor to check me out. When the physician came to examine me, it would turn out there was cause for serious alarm. After a thorough physical exam, he determined that every single lymph node in my body was inflamed. The doctor was emphatic. I need to get you to the hospital right away. My look of resistance prompted him to explain that he had to rule out cancer of the lymph nodes. In no way did I expect this frightening possibility. Will accompanied me to the hospital. Once the doctor drained fluid from my nodes, not a pleasant experience, trust me, and ran some tests. He came back with his findings. So far, no evidence of cancer. I was relieved, but still worried. His concern was, for your body to be reacting as it is, you must be under an enormous amount of stress. The doctor strongly suggested that I leave the tour. He believed that by putting my body through this ongoing pressurized intensity, I would end up very sick. It was hard to see how stress was the cause of how bad I was feeling, but I knew I had to consider taking a break. Sitting next to Will on the couch in our hotel room, I took a deep breath and said, I don't think I'm going to be able to finish. Will looked at me. He spoke very deliberately. I don't care if I have to have an ambulance follow you to every show or if you have to go on stage with an IV in your arm, but you are going to finish this. You have to finish what you started, he explained. Because if you quit now, you will regret it. I started to protest, but didn't have the energy. Will said it again. If you don't finish, you will regret it. And I can't let you do that. That's what all these people want, is for you to quit. They're waiting for you to do exactly that. And I won't let you. A part of me agreed with him, but I was also angry at how he had laid it on the line so strongly. No matter how pissed I was, I couldn't overlook the fact that Will was more right than wrong. I sat there on that couch in the hotel room and thought of another moment when I'd been afraid to finish something I'd started. There was a lesson I needed to remember. It had happened not long after I worked on the movie Collateral, which was a wonderful opportunity to become really good friends with Tom Cruise. Unlike many people I've come across in different settings, Tom had the rare ability to see through my great act of having it all together all the time. Without saying it, he picked up on moments when I was feeling far less than worthy. Sometimes I would hold back on the red carpet or when doing press. Tom always had a powerful reminder for me in those instances. Hey, he would begin and look me right in the eye. Never forget how smart and talented you are. Now go out there and make somebody smile because you shook their hand on the red carpet today. 
That was so helpful. All I had to do was get past my fear. Early in our friendship, Tom and I found out we shared a love of motorcycles, and I was super excited when we made a plan to ride on his dirt bike track. There was no holding back or being small when the opportunity came. In fact, I was really feeling myself from the moment I sat on the dirt bike he selected for me and revved its engine to rip on the track as we took off. Enjoying the ride, I had no qualms about trying to jump off a small ramp, only to feel the thrill of catching air. The problem was that after going up, the bike and I descended rapidly to the ground, and I couldn't manage to land the bike. As soon as I hit the ground, I was thrown from the bike and landed on my back, hitting my head hard. Thank God I had on a helmet. Jada, are you okay? Tom asked, rushing to my side and kneeling down. I took off my helmet, and though I was shaken up, I said, I'm fine. Relieved but concerned, Tom let me know I'd done some good riding, but that I should stop for the day. Bringing myself to my elbows, I looked up at him and asked a really important question of him and of myself. How many times have you reminded me to not let fear stand in my way? If I don't get back on this bike right now and do another lap, I may never get on a bike again. Tom paused for a moment, said nothing, and then smiled the biggest smile. He stood up, put out his hand, which I grabbed to pick myself up off the ground. Okay, one more round. I was scared as hell to get back on that bike, but the lesson was, it's not about not being scared when you need to move past fear. It's about finding the courage to freaking do it anyway, even if you don't think you can. Doing it again is the only way to prevent the fear from conquering you. Finding the courage is easier when someone has confidence in you, like Tom with me getting back on the bike and Will with me finishing the tour. This memory amplified the idea that it wasn't about trying to prove something to other people, but about proving to myself that I could finish what I started. Not only did we complete the run of Ozfest, but we finished with a bang and a massive thunderstorm in Palm Beach, Florida. I remember getting a lot of dabs from bands on the tour who hadn't believed we would stick it out. All I could think about was Will and how right he had been. The exhilaration I felt for soldiering through was incredible. I had set out to achieve a goal, to let my primal self be free, and I had done so. I tell you what, having the opportunity to watch masterful bands like Black Sabbath and Mastodon play live every day gave me some of the best times of my life, as well as sharing the stage with the dope female lead performer from Arch Enemy at the time. Angela Gosau, who killed it at every performance. I learned so much and made so many friends, like the crew from Bury Your Dead, Brent Hines from Mastodon, and many more. I found so much commonality with people of different backgrounds whom I met in that time. Not every single gig reached high notes, but there was almost always a connection that we could acknowledge. Man, We have lived this moment, this piece of life, together, and it was fun. Even though I used to call myself a wild banshee on stage, it wasn't about being wild and out of control for its own sake. No, I got to shake off the domestication that had wrapped around me over the years. I needed the wild banshee who used to prowl the streets of Baltimore at midnight, the one who loved walking on the edges of danger, So many of us forsake our primal callings because we have to make a living, be the dutiful daughter or son or PTA member, and adhere to guidelines that make us worthy in the eyes of others. There are many outlets besides metal music that we can all seek in order to escape whatever boxes we've put ourselves in. Our inner banshee wants us to give her some space to breathe, to rattle her cage, to get dirty, and to escape all the societal demands to be acceptable, appropriate, and frankly, perfect. Perfectionism, and its more dangerous cousin, romanticism, if unchecked, can cut off your oxygen supply. 
I'm grateful for it all. The victory was, whether you liked our music or not, you could not question the heart of wicked wisdom. Just as OzFest was ending, we got an astonishing offer to be one of the opening acts for Guns N' Roses on their 2005 European tour. It was beyond imaginable. We barely had a breather before we needed to go out on the road again. During my brief downtime, I hightailed it up to San Francisco, where Will and Jaden were about to start principal photography on the pursuit of happiness. As soon as I arrived, I faced a crossroads. Although I desperately wanted to go out with the Guns N' Roses, there was no part of me willing to leave Jaden's side while he made this very intense movie. It was his first major role, and Will would not have the bandwidth to play his father on screen and be daddy off screen. Not for a movie that told such a story. Will needed me there as well to make sure Jaden had what he needed emotionally for this experience. Seeking my own counsel, as is my preference, I walked out into the San Francisco night air and thought of Jaden and all the time he'd sacrificed, traveling all over the world with me so that I could live my dreams, whether it was going to Australia for a year and a half for The Matrix or being away from all his friends to travel on a tour bus with me so I could perform with my band. Now it was my turn to sacrifice for him. I decided to let go of the offer to be an opener for Guns N' Roses. We still made our second album, and we still went on to perform at some fantastic venues, including going out on tour with one of my favorite bands, Seven Dust, and playing the Download Fest the following summer in the UK. Then we put a pause on the band. I never regretted any of those decisions. Pursuing a dream of getting to rock hard for nearly five years had given me myself in a way that nothing else could. At the time when I stopped, I had gone as far as I needed to go, even if I could have continued. My children were growing up and starting to build their own lives and pursue their own paths. I didn't want to miss out on watching them soar. They'd been with me on my flight, and I wanted to be with them for theirs. A woman who is starved for her real soul life may look cleaned up and combed on the outside, but on the inside, she's filled with dozens of pleading hands and empty mouths. Clarissa Pincola Estes, Women Who Run With The Wolves One of the biggest traps for women is the pressure to cut off the most ugly, primal, wild, and unapologetic parts of ourselves so we can feel accepted and worthy. Traditionally, men were given outlets more so than women to express their more primitive selves. In recent years, though, men increasingly suffer in silence because they aren't allowed their primal screams either, as if the nature of masculine energy itself is criminal. We're just starting to talk more about the need for men to be willing to heal so the world can feel the beauty of balanced masculine energy. As women, some of us fear revealing our less domesticated sides. We're mired in the bargain that if we act clean and proper, we'll be rewarded with love everlasting, delivered in a big red box with a bow. Otherwise, we might be expendable. We're afraid that if we don't live up to the standards, we will be exiled by family, friends, culture. We make sure we're never caught with our nails dirty teeth snarling. When we lose touch with that feminine, feral force inside us, we end up losing a vital energy that cultivates fervor, fearlessness, boldness, zeal, sincerity, and the drive to love hard, fight hard, dance, and play hard. This cutting off of the primal, whatever our expression of it may be, can leave us hollow, angry, and starved. Watch out. A starved woman can be one of the most dangerous creatures on the planet. What aspect of yourself do you believe you need to cut off to be accepted, respected, loved, and cared for? Is there an outlet 
that offers that untended part of yourself a safe place to roam free? Do you like to paint, dance, go camping, climb trees, kickbox, travel, go on wild adventures? Can you push yourself out of your comfort zone? 